Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we've done. Uh, we got early access to Quilt, um, and we've had a chance to try a few things with it. Now, we've only had a couple of weeks with it, so what we've been able to do is pretty limited. Um, but let me start off by telling you a little bit about Horizon. So in terms of what we're trying to do as a company, um, we're focused on a different kind of bottleneck in quantum computing. So clearly, Rigetti is focused on the major bottleneck facing everyone, which is building hardware. Uh, if we don't have hardware, we don't have any quantum computing. But there's another bottleneck. There's probably many. But the one we're focused on is an algorithm's bottleneck. So uh, there's this minor problem um, that quantum algorithms are hard to build. Um, maybe this isn't as true for NISC term, uh, NISC kind of variational approaches. Uh, there's a kind of standard approach to building variational algorithms. Um, but if you want something that has kind of exponentially large speed ups and things like this, kind of grow, uh, shore type speed ups, um, then this is kind of a hard problem. It's not something that the field as a whole has been particularly good at overcoming. So the number of different types of techniques we have for generating algorithms is relatively small. So what we're trying to do is to get to a point where we can take classical code as input, something like MATLAB code, um, and compile that directly to something you can run on a quantum processor. And I don't mean synthesizing the reversible logic and just expressing the program in terms of Toffley gates or something like that. I mean actually breaking down the program, figuring out what the program is doing, uh, figuring out what parts of that can be sped up, either by reducing implicit complexity where the data types you're using have some implicit overhead for doing operations between them, or explicit complexity where you've written large loops and things like this that can be simplified and accelerated on a quantum computer using a variety of techniques. Um, but ultimately, we care about going all the way down. There's no point in outputting something that can't run. So we're trying to go from something that takes a very, very high level language, something that you could compile and run on a conventional computer, not in simulation, but just directly run on a conventional processor, uh, and to be able to compile that into something that has a quantum, uh, has some quantum speed up and can be run on a, a real processor. One of the things we encounter with this, however, is that the kinds of algorithms we generate, the kinds of programs we generate, are deeper than many NISC circuits. So, you know, perhaps more than many others, we're particularly concerned about noise. Um, in terms of the, the compiler structure we have, basically at the, the top level, you take in something that's effectively a classical language. It's quite like MATLAB uh, or Octave, and then that gets compiled down. But you can also put in source code at other levels of the compiler. So we call the, uh, the classical language carbon. And then beneath that, we have something called beryllium that you can think of a little bit like uh, quantum C++. Um, beneath that, we have something we call helium, which is basically quantum basic. Uh, and below that, we have something we call hydrogen that's a bit like Quill. So it's just a, a gate level language. Um, and the bottom three of these languages basically are concerned with just programming the quantum device. So the, uh, the quantum processor itself, plus any classical control that's associated with it, but not programming a quantum, sorry, not programming a classical computer to interpret those results. Um, the bit I'm gonna focus on uh, where our demonstration comes in uh, is on the lowest level of this, in terms of how we can, uh, how we can uh, compile a particular gate set to the, per, to the native gates of a particular hardware platform. Uh, so this is something we've been very fortunate to have, uh, have access to the Rigetti systems on and to be able to uh, try some things out. So what we're going for is basically a loop where we can characterize the hardware and take into account that characterization in terms of uh, synthesizing gates and mapping between gates, similar to what's done in Quill C, um, but there are some other things that we're trying to do that give maybe some, some little uh, extra boost in performance in some cases. So the particular thing I want to talk about is uh, stray couplings. So in a processor, uh, in your quantum processor, you have a number of qubits, um, and these qubits talk to each other. 
Um, and sometimes they talk to each other when you don't expect them to. So there's some, some residual coupling between qubits and the device. Uh, and the effect of that is that the frequency of a particular qubit is shifted slightly depending on the state of other qubits to which it's coupled. Um, so for example, if all of the qubits, and you can try this out on, uh, when you're running code on the processor, if you do an experiment where you start all of the other qubits on the lattice in zero, uh, and you do a single qubit experiment, uh, you get somewhat different results than if you uh, put all of the other qubits in superposition. Um, and part of the reason for this is that there's some stray coupling between, uh, between different qubits within the device, as well as maybe some coupling to the environment. But really what you're seeing when you affect the other qubits is coupling between physical qubits in the, in the device. So um, this has the effect of shifting, uh, shifting the energies a little bit. Um, and so the frequency at which you send in your pulse the optimal frequency kind of depends on the state of what the neighbors are in. So if you wanted to try to get the best possible performance out of your device, you would maybe use, you would maybe update the frequency of your pulse and just change the frame uh, when you're doing a, uh, when you're doing single qubit gates based on whether you know the other qubits in the neighborhood to be in zeros or to be in ones or if they're in a superposition. So if they're in zeros, perhaps we want to uh, aim for this, uh, this highest level here. Uh, if, they're, uh, if they're about in one, maybe it's shifted down a bit. Uh, and this is, the effect of this is basically a, a slow Z rotation in one direction or another, depending on the state of the neighbors. And if they're in a superposition, you know, we need to shoot somewhere in the middle with a pulse that's broad enough that it, that it has good effect on, on all of the different states. Um, so all I'm gonna show you is just very simple, uh, very simply, um, the effect of updating the frame. So we start out all of the qubits, instead of in zero, we start them in a superposition of zero plus one, uh, and we look at the effect on one qubit. So we see, does that qubit stay in a plus state or does it precess one way or the other? Uh, and all we're looking at is what's the probability of measuring the plus state as a plus state later on. So we do a pi over two pulse to put it into the superposition. We'll do the same thing again and then read it out, but we'll do some, some weight in between. Okay, um, this is just basically a Ramsey experiment. Um, so before I, before I show you this, uh, let me first mention how you could measure these things. And this is a, a, a standard experiment. It's just a joint Ramsey experiment. So uh, you can map out where the stray couplings on the processor are, basically by taking a single qubit, uh, putting it into a superposition of zero plus one, and waiting for it to precess. Now that will trace out some, some curve, and we use an artificial rotation on top of it, so we can kind of see, uh, see how the effect of time is adding up. Uh, so you can see these curves on the, uh, let me see over here, uh, so you can think of the purple one here as when the neighbors are all in zero, and then the red curve as occurring when I flip one of the neighbors into the one state. So I guess you can see that the frequency with which uh, this oscillates is changed slightly. And this, this, difference, in, this difference in frequency uh, tells us what the coupling strength is with the neighbor we flipped from zero to one. Um, so this is, uh, this is kind of a, a map of a, a sub-lattice of, um, of the Aspen 7 device and shows where the stray couplings are, roughly the, the strength of them when we happen to run this. Um, there is some technical challenges you run into, not least of all that if you count up how many of the pairs there are, there's, somewhat, there's just under 400 for the 28 qubits that were available to us, um, and that would make it extremely long. Hence, uh, we have a, like a good picture of a smaller lattice. Um, we've been working on a way to accelerate that. So rather than having to do 400 different runs, we can now do it in five with a whole load of simultaneous measurements and then post-processing the results. Uh, and I'll show you a picture of that at the end. It's still quite noisy because we still don't have it quite fast enough yet to be able to get good statistics. Um, but uh, I wanted to show you just the effect of updating the frame for this. 
so we know that these stray couplings exist within devices, and it's not just particular to Rigetti devices. They're in all the, super all of the, the superconducting processors. Um, and there's some, there's, some different, uh, there's some different effect depending on whether the qubits, uh, neighboring qubits are in superposition or if they're in zero or one. So your, your qubit that you're looking at is rotating one way or another depending on the state of its neighbors. And if they're in superposition, it's not really rotating one way or another. Instead, different branches are going in different ways and this leads to dephasing. Um, what you can do though is if you update the frame uh, so that your frequency for the qubit is right in the middle of that distribution, um, then it turns out you get kind of better performance. So this is just the decay of uh, a plus state, you know, the probability of seeing it still in a plus state after some time. Uh, the red line is the original with no changes. Uh, and the green line in here is just with a frame update. Um, and it's not, it's maybe not so obvious looking at this why that's the case, um, but it will become much more obvious in the next slide. Uh, for comparison, the blue line here is what happens when we decouple that qubit from all of the other qubits by doing a spin echo experiment. So that means we leave the qubit alone for half the time, then we flip the qubit, then we wait another half period, and then we measure. Now, there's a problem with that. Clearly, the spin echo experiment does really well, um, and it extends the lifetime of the qubit. But the problem you have is that you can't really do this in parallel. It's qubits within the device that are coupled to each other. So if you flip all of the qubits halfway through, they still remain coupled. Because the, the coupling you see is basically a ZZ term. Uh, and if you do an X to flip each qubit, those two Xs are going to commute with your ZZ interaction, and you still build up the phase. So if you want to try to avoid this, what you need to do is schedule your flips so that you flip different qubits at different times. Uh, and the yellow line is the kind of simplest example of this. So this is just flipping either, either, uh, either even or odd qubits essentially within the device. We're just flipping them at alternate times. So first we flip the even ones, then we flip the odd ones, then we flip the even ones again, then we read out. Uh, and so you can see this, this had a, a reasonable effect as well. Uh, so it gives some boost in performance, but not, not quite as good as you get when you fully decouple a single qubit. But fully decoupling a single qubit means it's not interacting with the rest of the computation. So you can't really do that uh, and still get entanglement, still be able to run a general circuit. This is a more extreme example. Um, so this qubit is more strongly coupled to some of the neighbors than, uh, than the original one. And the effect of this Okay, it looks, it's, it's kind of strange behavior here for the original uh, uncorrected um, frame. But the reason for this is that it's actually okay when all of the other qubits are in zero. So if you book an instance on the lattice and you're only using, uh, you're only using two qubits and, and all of the other qubits are in zero, then you know, that's good. I mean, you want, you want this to be tuned for that to be the case. But if you're, using, uh, if you're using a lot of qubits in the system, then that shifts the frequency that that qubit is likely to see. Uh, and so now it starts to pick up this slow oscillation. So it's, this is entirely correctable noise. That's why it's an oscillation rather than just decay. Uh, and so your frame update, which gives you the green line here, uh, actually gives you, you know, really significantly longer uh, lifetimes when the other qubits are in superposition. And this is just using the frame update feature in Quilty. Uh, and again, for comparison, there's the decoupling pulses, which again give, give somewhat more extension, but you can start combining techniques. Um, and I just wanted to show you the output of uh, our, you know, our attempt to map uh, all of the lattice in one shot, uh, where stray couplings are. Um, I should say some of these are reasonably accurate. Um, but some of the large couplings you see here, particularly in the second one, um, these aren't, uh, th these are just a result of a bad fit. So we don't have very large statistics, um, so we have quite high shot noise on our estimates. Um, so we're trying to get this better so that we can run in about 20 minutes to be able to characterize all the couplings on a device. Um, there's also couplings between different parts of the lattice that I haven't shown you, but 
we're generally trying to shoot for a regime where we can characterize the processor, uh, use that information to update our pulses, and then run, run programs, and then repeat the process. So we can characterize as needed. Um, that's it. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>